I think that um, that's the wrong question. I think the question of whether there is or isn't a shift is a question for the entertainment industry to manage. Um, there's a tiny number of people who work in the entertainment industry. I'm one of them, so I imagine it's very important to them. It's, it's important to me to know how my books will be sold, but why should it be important to anyone else how my books are sold? There's a tiny number of people involved in the industry. The most important question about access and ownership is not how do the vanishingly small number of people in the entertainment industry earn their living. The important thing is that if you want to send me a game or a song or a movie or a book but not let me keep it, you somehow have to be able to enforce policy on my computer. You have to be able to be sure that even though my computer has a copy of the file that you've sent me, that it doesn't keep that copy of the file. And in order for that to happen, my computer has to be able to run programs that you trust and that I don't trust. My computer has to be designed so that third parties can enforce policy on a computer that has a camera and a microphone and knows how to access my bank account and knows who all my friends are and I take it with me into the bedroom and I take it with me into the bathroom and it uh, knows all the places that I go and it knows every one of my intimate secrets. The idea that that device should be designed so that I can't control it and so that other parties can issue a commands that I can't even see, let alone stop. That idea is so wrong on its face that to me, it swamps any question about whether it's right or wrong. It's like saying, well, I have this plan. We're going to help everybody uh, who, who eats at a restaurant. We're going to help them by reducing the amount of gravity in the restaurants. And uh, since we can't really do reductions of the amount of gravity in the restaurant, we're going to pass a law that says everybody has to wear a harness and there will be people who walk along on stilts and hold them up with the harness to make it feel like there's less gravity. I mean, it's a silly idea. It has no technical relationship to removing gravity, but the important thing about it is not its silliness or its absence of a relationship to technology. It's the fact that you're going to be followed around all the time by people who got you in a harness. So I think I would actually go one step up from the idea that the problem is uh, how copyrights uh, terms and exceptions or uh, limitations and exceptions are, are moving into the 21st century. I think the real problem is that copyright applies to people who aren't in the entertainment industry. So the real politic of copyright has always been that although there's a law that prohibits everybody from duplicating a record album, really it only affects people who own record album factories. And so it can be as complicated and as baroque as it needs to be to reflect the industrial realities of people who own printing presses, of people who own record factories, of people who own film production labs. And that um, it's an industrial rule. And the industrial rule was uh, had a test built into it to see whether you were part of the industry. And that test was whether you were making or handling copies. And at one point, that was a pretty good proxy for whether you were in the industry, but it's not anymore. It's like, imagine if we actually had banking regulation, which would be a wonderful thing. And that banking regulation said, if you, use, if you do a transaction that's worth a million euros, you have to tell the central bank about it, and you're a bank. Because anyone using a million euros is in the finance industry by definition. And then like tomorrow, uh, all of the, uh, the nations that are struggling with austerity default on their debts, the euro crashes, and suddenly it costs a million euros to buy a sandwich, and you take me out for lunch. Does that make you a banker, or does that make a million euros not the right test for who's in the banking industry? The problem is that not that the, we have the wrong contracts to watch TV on the internet, the problem is the absolutely insane idea that reading a book or watching TV or listening to a song involves a contract, right? That is on its face an insane idea. It's not insane to say that you need a license and therefore a contract in order to do something industrial with a book, a song. I'm glad that my publishers have to sign a contract to publish my books. What's insane is the idea that just because copying is easy, everybody is now a publisher. That's just not true. And so it not only undermines public rights, but it undermines the idea of copyright. Because um, 
the public can't accept or read through or deal with these contracts. They're not written for public consumption. Consumers Union in the United States estimated that in order to deal with all the contracts you agree to every day, it would take 27 hours a day to read through all of those contracts before you agreed to them. So what it leads the public to believe is that copyright is nonsense. Right? Not that it has the wrong limitations and exceptions, not that the contracts are unfair, but that it is silly, that it makes no sense, that it has no validity, that it is some kind of weird Stalinist fantasy. And that is the real problem with terms and, exception, terms and, and, and uh, conditions and limitations and exceptions. Is it enough to ensure that people go on producing in the way that they've produced for the last 15 years? Maybe not, but remember, the kind of movies we've made for the last 15 years are not the movies they made in the 15 years before, let alone the 100 years we had before that. Uh, YouTube's getting 96 hours of video every minute right now. Um, over the course of a month, more video is uploaded to YouTube than has been commercially produced in the history of the world, every month. So the idea that we are running out of business models that sustain video production is on its face wrong. But what we may be running out of is business models that sustain the kind of production we had for the last 15 years. And the kind of production we had for the last 15 years did not come down off a mountain on two stone tablets. Right? Nobody said, thou shalt make $500 million reboots of comic books. Right? That is a, that is a, a new idea. It has, there's no reason to believe it will endure, and there's no reason to intervene to ensure that it endures. So far, though, it actually seems to be enduring, right? Last year was the best year ever in the history of Hollywood box offices. It beat the previous best year, which was the year before, which beat the previous best year, which was the year before. Um, the new uh, Disney movie, which is very good, Frozen, has been in theaters for just a few months now. It's broken the billion dollar mark in cinema receipts. So. I don't know that there's an evidence that there's an actual, genuine, existential problem. Some firms are thriving, some firms are failing, some movies do well, some movies do poorly, the sector grows, it shrinks. Is the sector in itself endangered? That seems to me to be a fact, not an evidence. But even if it is, that's like saying, you know, we love our giant cathedrals. You know, the cathedral in Colm, it's so beautiful. And we have this one church and this one church is able to muster three generations of craftsmen to build these beautiful cathedrals that we all agree are wonderful. And here is this asshole, Martin Luther, and he wants to break up the one church into a thousand churches. And without it, we'll never build a cathedral again. Religion is doomed. Now, it's true. We stopped building cathedrals like we did before Martin Luther came along. But the idea that Martin Luther endangered religion is wrong on its face. More people were engaged in religion in more ways. The purpose of copyright law is not to ensure that five giant Hollywood studios, three giant record labels, and five giant publishers remain solvent. The purpose of copyright law is to ensure that the largest number of people are able to create the most diverse uh, quantity of works that please the largest and most diverse quantity of audiences. And on that metric, I think, what we have now is not a problem, it's a solution. I think Lanier mistakes capitalism for the internet um, and, uh, and a particular kind of neoliberal uh, late stage capitalism for the internet. The fact that automation uh, allows more stuff to be done with fewer labor inputs is not bad, right? The fact that like everybody uses the toilet but only some people have to clean them is not good. And if we invented a way for toilets to clean themselves, that would be a net positive for the human race. Now, if having done so, we did nothing to distribute the benefits of that um, new productivity gain to the people who clean toilets and said, now you have to beg in the streets. That would be a problem, but it's not a problem of self-cleaning toilets. It's a problem of neoliberalism that says that owning things is the most important fact uh, about, of, the, of the 21st century and not doing things or making things. Um, Jaron argues that, and, and I don't understand why, argues that, um, the internet has made it harder for people who make abstract, difficult jazz to earn a living. 
that just seems wrong on its face. The number of people who earned a living making difficult abstract jazz before the internet came along could be counted on the fingers of one hand. There was never a golden era in which uh, people who made difficult abstract jazz music were earning a living. In fact, the majority of people who earned a living from music were uh, people who were staunchly embroiled in the studio and label system, and they were a tiny, minute fraction of all the people who ever wanted to make music. That continues to be the case, right? Most people who ever set out to be an artist will not make any money from the arts. Uh, the best thing we can do to help them realize their dream is to reduce how much money they lose trying to be in the arts, because almost everybody who's ever tried to be in the arts lost money doing it. Lowering costs to reach audiences, lowering costs to produce, lowering costs to make things, that's um, uh, an absolutely valid intervention to democratize art. Uh, now, it's true that we've had regulatory interventions that centralize the internet to its enormous detriment. Those include, uh, for example, making copyright law so stringent that in order to host other people's video, you have to build a database of all the copyrighted works ever made so you can run an automated takedown service, which means that there will only ever be one large video hosting company, and its name is YouTube. Right? That has been a massively centralizing function. The way that we've regulated our telecoms companies has been an absolute shame, a global shame, that has led not only to enormous prices and, and, and inadequate access and easy censorship of the internet, but also has led to the fiber optic choke points that the NSA spied on. But the thing is that Jaron appears to be a man who likes his firing squad arranged in a circle. Because if you looked around for the people who believed that telecom should be better regulated so that we had a greater diversity, that copyright should be better regulated so that it didn't ensure that there was only one company that could host video, you will find the people that Jaron Lanier is most upset with. And I think that that has been um, uh, a real failing in his argument. And the, the fact that he's never managed to or attempted to separate uh, the value of technological productivity gains from the social problems that arise from an economic system that only awards people who build robots, who own robots, and not people who used to make the things that the robots now make, that's a, a, a piece of massive economic uh, uh, illiteracy that boggles my mind whenever I hear him say it. So the Americans used to have this, this thing they said when they were um, napalming villages in Vietnam. They said, we have to destroy the village to save it. Um, the idea that we can save the open web by making it not open anymore is a nonsense on its face. Um, I think that my argument about the W3C is that the job of a standards body is to produce technologies that, incur that encourage interoperability. And uh, the idea specifically of the W3C is not only to encourage the interoperability on the web, but also the integrity of the web, its robustness, and the um, safety and security of web users. That has been its traditional work product. Now, in almost every country in which web users live, uh, people who use the web uh, cannot be told if their browsers have critical flaws in them that expose them to enormous harms if those browsers integrate digital rights management. Because in almost every country in which web users live, the US Trade Representative has pushed for laws that make it illegal to uh, tell people things that will allow you to circumvent digital rights management. And vulnerabilities in digital rights management are how you bootstrap circumventions. We know that where there has been digital rights management that's widely deployed in the field that had critical bugs, that security researchers who discovered those bugs were reluctant to come forward, and that they spent months and sometimes longer before coming forward with the news of those bugs. Meanwhile, the people who were infected by those bugs spent those months uh, at risk of being taken over by uh, unscrupulous people. Now, we just saw yesterday the latest Snowden leak uh, showed that the NSA is hoping to uh, scale up its program by which it infects people's computers. They want to be able to infect, quote, millions of computers at a time with malicious software that allows them to control cameras, microphones, keystrokes, and so on. And the way to do that is to exploit unpatched vulnerabilities in computers. 
Having digital rights management in everything that has a web interface means that everything that has a web interface, which is everything, your car, your thermostat, everything in your world is going to have these things, um, uh, will be a reservoir of long-lived critical vulnerabilities that researchers are afraid to report for risk of being uh, sued by the entertainment industry because you undermine the digital rights management when you report the vulnerabilities. Now, there's actually a very easy fix for this. If the W3C wants to encourage DRM and still wants to encourage interoperability, they could require that anyone who participates in their DRM work sign a covenant just like the one they have for patents right now. If you work on a standard at the W3C, you have to promise not to sue anyone who implements a any of the standards work you participate in if, if it violates one of your patents. You have to agree to license your patents to everyone. You could have a similar thing where if you participate in digital rights management at the W3C or if you adopt any of its digital rights management work products, you have to sign a covenant that says you won't sue anyone who makes an interoperable product because interoperability is the purpose of a standard. The idea that you can make an inter a standard compliant object without a license from someone defeats the entire purpose of standards. And you should sign a covenant that says you won't um, sue people who report vulnerabilities. Now, I think this will substantially weaken the case for DRM on the web. And, and you know, I'd be disingenuous if I said otherwise. But I think that there is no way that the W3C can say, well, we want to make standards, but we don't care whether or not you get sued for pointing out flaws in the security of things that implement the standard or whether you get sued for making things that adopt the standard. That can't be the purpose of the W3C. If that's the purpose of the W3C, we don't need the W3C. So, uh, you know, Berners-Lee is doing very good work now, this Magna Carta of the internet, this idea of the building the web we want. And he talks about freedom from spying, and he talks about freedom from security breaches, and he talks about net neutrality. Those things are intimately related to the idea that anyone should be able to not only implement a web browser, but inspect the web browser and report on flaws in the web browser. And if that's not the W3C's work, it is absolutely incompatible with this whole project of the web we want.